but I'm gonna introduce him anyways. Uh, this is my good friend Gerard Way. How you guys doing? Alright, so um, so who's reading comics from the Young Animal line? Cool, thank you. Thanks for supporting that. And um, and any um, any people who are fans of Doom Patrol prior? Anybody who's no longer a fan of Doom Patrol after my version. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think what I would want to first start talking about here is, um, you know, clearly Young Animal is a new imprint, and I think the idea behind it was that uh, DC had approached you and said, hey, we, we, want, we want you to put together this line of comics, and they wanted to kind of take that DC Vertigo aesthetic and mix it with the work that you were doing, which is, I think, kind of groundbreaking, and, um, and bring these two things together. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was many years of conversations. Uh, as a lot of people know, I started as an intern at DC Comics. I used to photocopy the pages before they would, this before scanners were a big deal. And um, um, so uh, I knew all the editors a little bit. I used to drop them off their comics in shrunken down form. And um, so anyway, it'd been years of talking to Shelley Bond. Um, it was amazing. Yeah. And we talked about doing something at Vertigo a long time ago, so we always kind of stayed in touch and, you know, uh, been friends with Jim Lee for a really long time as well. He's very close with my brother, and he'd been coming to shows with his wife, and, you know, that was pretty amazing. So we had this relationship, and then we, we went and did a comic convention in South America together, and we would have these dinners every night, and we just kind of kept talking about um, doing an imprint or something. The, the idea was Jim's to do an imprint. Oh, right on. And so now, um, and Shelley Bond was at DC at the time when you were interning. Yes. yes. And um, and I know it's hard when you're an intern, you don't necessarily meet everybody, but you did eventually have conversations with her. I did. You know, she 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 uh, she's awesome. She she doesn't remember me at all from those days, and she's very upfront about that. And one of the things I love about Shelley, she's she will be like, she's like, I I don't have any recollection of you as an intern. <laughs> Um, which I thought was pretty cool, and uh, but we would talk about music. That was always the thing. Like you knew you could talk to Shelley about music, like David Bowie or Britpop. So excellent. And so now, when you when you start to bring this together, did you know that you were going to pick Doom Patrol and some of these other series? The imprint was almost built around me writing Doom Patrol. Right. I knew, you know, I knew that I had really wanted to do that. That was like a, that was like a life dream goal, you know, uh, wish list thing, bucket yeah. list thing. So, uh, the imprint was really built kind of around the take that we were going to bring to Doom Patrol, right. and kind of construct the imprint around that. Now, and, and clearly, you're really good friends with Grant Morrison. Um, Grant Morrison has collaborated with you musically as in addition to being just a uh, kind of good mentor in comics. Yes. And um, so it's kind of a, a series as beloved and strange as Grant Morrison's run on Doom Patrol, kind of a Dada-esque um, approach to superheroes, um, is, is difficult to replicate and probably not necessarily something you wanted to do exactly the same anyhow. So in your take on Doom Patrol, what do you think makes it different from what came before and what were the challenges you faced in approaching writing these characters? Well, you know, uh, first of all, it, it, it would be impossible to replicate what Grant was doing yeah. with Richard Case, like, you know, so I wasn't even going to try. More, you know, the thing that was important to me was to touch on <clears throat> some of those characters, though. Yeah. Because those books are still in print. Yeah. You know, more so than I think a lot of other runs, you know, besides the original run, right. which is fantastic. but. Um, it's so, an omnibus that's been yeah, separately Yeah, it's, it's out there. It's in stories. the consciousness. So these are characters that were way ahead of their time, and uh, I felt like bringing them back, but I was totally going to do it the way I wanted to. Right. Um, I think there's an element... Uh, I, think my, I, think, I think when I write weird comics, I think they're a little different than Grant's weird comics. Yes. I think, I, first of all, his are way smarter than mine, <laughs> and 
I think mine are more um, casual slice of life, a little bit. Like there's some love and rockets to it. More emotional. Yeah, I think it's yeah. more emotional, and it's more lyrical, obviously. Yeah. You know. Well, the um, so in picking your collaborators for these projects, because uh, because you're you can draw. I I can draw. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's. I don't know if people realize that um, Gerard went to SVA, School of Visual Arts. Does anybody out there go to SVA? You guys do? What's your major? Yeah, cartooning major. Yep. Which is how you wound up interning at DC Comics. That is how, yeah. I, I had a writing class with Joey Cavalieri, who was the editor of Superman at the time, and uh, he got me the internship. And I basically interned under him, but I was really in the what they call the FedEx room. Yeah. We make sure all the creators get their... get their... <laughs> the mail room. The, uh, kind of, the, kind it's of like the, the pre-mail room. They had an intense mail room yeah. in a lower level. Yeah. But we were like the photocopy slash... The co copy boy. I was the copy yeah. boy. Yeah. So now, um, we're gonna run down the titles really quickly and we're gonna dig into each one of them individually. And um, we've already started with Doom Patrol, so I think um, we're gonna talk about the other titles and then we'll, we'll go back deep into each. So, um, how'd you partner with Nick for, uh, for Doom Patrol? That was, you know, the Doom Patrol team was the first team to come together. Um, Shelly found Nick, yeah. you know. She had known his name, I, I believe, through Mike Allred. Yeah. Who's amazing. And um, I believe that Nick was friends with Mike Allred. And she just, you know, the, one of the, one of the Shelly methods is you just, contact somebody even if you haven't heard for them heard, heard of them or heard from them in like 10 years and then you just ask them to do like a, a drawing and, and you know that's kind of what she does that's um, nice and her office is like kind of covered with these drawings that she just gets people to but a lot of times they just do it on their own because they they're excited she gets right. people excited you know now does any is anyone here familiar with uh nick derringer's poster art did a lot of posters for Alamo Drafthouse, different rock bands, and that type of thing. Yeah, Nick Darrington, he, he left comics for about 10 years. He'd, right. he'd done some stuff, I, did think, I think he did some escapist stuff as right. well. Um, and then he worked in animation, and he, he moved to Texas, and he was working there for like a decade. Yeah. So this is his first comic work in a really long time. Now the, the other titles are Cave Carson Has a Cybernetic Eye, and um, your collaborators uh, with that, or the team behind that, is um, Michael Avon Emming. Yes, who's amazing, Mike Oming. Um, Powers, um, Mice Templar, um, and you're writing that with John Rivera. I am, yes. Writing John's John a great Rivera. guy. Yes. Full disclosure, John and I have done a movie together, maybe. We're not sure if we're in the final cut. Um, and uh, John, you may know from his heartbreak graphic novels, and um, and then if we go on to um, Shade the Changing Girl. Shade the Changing Girl is uh, a product of Marley Zarconi. Marley Zarconi, yeah. And we gotta mention the colorist, so Nick Filardi is doing colors. Nick from Filardi. Katie Carson. Yep. And Clem Robbins is doing the letters. Yes, yes. And um, and so Cecil Castellucci. Is doing Shade, yes, she's writing she's the shade. writer of Shade. And we've got um, Saida Tomafonte lettering and Kelly Fitzpatrick coloring. Yep, Marley Zarconi on art, yep. yep. And um, we've got Mother Panic, which is um, being written by Jody Hauser and uh, illustrated by Tommy Lee Edwards. And um, and that's the only title that hasn't streeted yet. Yes, that comes out uh, November. Right, right. Yeah. And so, um, now, many of these books, Doom Patrol is a, a full... we got to mention the rest of the Doom Patrol team. Yes. It started with Nick, and then kind of later on, we got Tamara, and right. then she started coloring. Um, after the black and white art was done for a while, we were just like, who's going to color it? And Shelly again said, what about Tamara? Wow. Bombalane, and we said, awesome, cool. And um, lettering is done by the legendary Todd Klein on that. So. Multiple Eisner Award winning letterer. Um, the lettering in, in these, these comics is kind of like a who's who, the best of. Um, there's got to be probably 15 Eisner Awards between the teams of yeah, letterers. For sure. uh, colorists, probably 10 Eisner Awards and, and other awards. Yeah. And, um, you know, Becky Cloonan doing the covers yeah. for, you know, uh, the, the Shade the Changing Girl covers. And now, if you, if you list, look at that list, and we've named off um, a good eight or nine uh, comic creators, most of whom you've all heard of, there's a, a lot of women involved in this line. Yeah, let's hear it. 
Um, anybody who's familiar with uh, my podcast knows that we tackle issues of diversity, and it's a, a central theme to what I talk about, and I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a line that has a lot of diverse faces and um, has a lot of women working in comics, but um, I think we've talked about this a little bit, that that wasn't necessarily the aim, that it was, you know, you know, what is it that you've said? It's yeah, like, you know, the aim of Young Animal is just to make the best books we can. Exactly. You know? And that was, to me, the most important. You know, there's three uh, women leads in the Young Animal books, arguably, if you, if you count Casey Brink, you know, and that, it wasn't really by design, it's just what happened. You yeah. know, Mother Panic was always going to be a woman because yeah. that's how, you know, she was conceived and things like that. And um, it was important to Shelley and I to make sure all women were on the team of Shade the Changing Girl yeah. and have that be that. But, you know, I think that people deserve to have a choice and putting that choice out there without saying, like, you have to read this because X, Y, Z. Right. Um, I, I don't think we're saying to anybody that you know, well, you are super awesome if you read the Young Animal books, but, but we're not saying if you don't read them, you're a bad person. Right. Like, we're not, um, I don't think the books have an agenda. The books just want to be special and different and fun, and I think that was part of the goal of the Young Animal. And that's one of the things that I think is important in having comics be more diverse, is that it all has to have a great level of quality from every individual creator. And so by bringing together and giving chances to people who are incredibly talented, for them to reach a wider audience, the odds after that is established of other voices and more people of color and more uh, women writing comics coming into the business becomes a little bit of an easier transition. And, and certainly um, there is a, a very different um, percentage of comic professionals now, say, than there were 20 years ago, that uh, there's a lot more women working in comics, there's a lot more people of color working in comics, and um, and I think comics have gotten better. You know, I think because have. of it. Yeah. You know, they're just more, you know, there's, there's just a lot of options now. They're just very different and vibrant and, you know, new voices and, and different perspectives, you know. But with Young Animal, it came down to, like, who are the best people to do these books? Like, who is the specific voice that we want Shade to have, you know, and, and Cecil really fit that, you know. And Certainly, you know, um, if, if you look at, at Cecil's list of credits and you're looking at um, some great young, young adult books in the Plain Jane series, um, you know, anybody read the Plain Jane series? Anyone familiar with her musical work? Uh, she was in a couple of great bands, you know. Um, Cecil first came out of Canada as a band member of the group Bite, and then um, they didn't record any music together, but then she launched another band, um, I think called Nerdy, Nerdy Girl. Girl. Nerdy Girl, yeah, yeah. Which I just discovered, We Cecil and I were having uh, lunch, and we were talking about Shade and where she wants to take it, and it's, it's going some really cool places, I'm very excited about it. Um, but she was like, oh yeah, I'm a musician, and then I went, she's like, I go, is it, is it on Apple Music? Can I get it? She goes, yeah, and I went and downloaded all her albums. Yeah. It's amazing, like, I just had no idea that's, that's one of the things she did. Which is going to so. be kind of awesome, you know, you work in a project with Gerard Way, and he finds out that you had a band, and then he downloads all your music and listens to it. We talked about doing um, a Shade song together, so, because we've, um, We've, you know, you heard it here first. We've now started um, doing music, which is something I wasn't fully expecting because I like to keep the music and the comics separate. But um, I thought if I could make music that wasn't necessarily totally me, and it and it could be perceived as somebody else making the music, and I could get guests and different people, um, that we could make some songs that come from the world of Young Animal, like the Cave Carson song we just put out. Um, that is supposed to be a song from a documentary in the 70s or 80s about Cave Carson and his family. So with Shade, we'll have to figure out how does that come from Shade's world? Is this, is this a band that Cecil fronts that Shade listens to that she discovers? Like, and that's my first instinct, you know? And um, who read Shade the Changing Man back in the day in the 90s? Anyone? Any fans? Now the... Um, Aside from just changing the gender of the main character in this, this reboot of the series, the alien uh, consciousness enters uh, the body of a girl in a coma who's actually a bully. And so there's this kind of 
fear of people of this this girl who just know this girl because of how mean she is and uh, the alien intelligence trying to come to grips with why it's being treated this way not just because it's an alien but because this particular body has baggage and it's I think incredibly important that a story of that um, of that level it's kind of heavy in some ways um, comes from someone who has such great experience writing young adult novels and has tackled kind of the opposite of that in, in several of her books and um, a really, really interesting take of the character. Um, full disclosure, Shade the Changing Man was my favorite series in the 1990s, and I love Shade the Changing Girl. And um, one other thing that I really love about it is that it has a backup story, and um, one of the artists who's done a backup story for, for Shade the Changing Girl, one pager, is Natalia Hernandez, and it's her first published work, and she is, of course, the daughter of Gilbert Hernandez of Love and Rockets fame. So, a little second generation love, you know? We're there. very, very happy to have her um, to be doing to doing that backup story with her dad. It was amazing. So I remember doing, a, we did a signing at Meltdown, and I sat right next to the Hernandez family, and she was there with her mini comics, which were amazing. She's about 11 years old. Yeah, that's the what they said. I was like, wow, was she, was she like 11 at the time? That's so, crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, because she, the changing man, had, had changed genders, I felt that it was comfortable for us, and it didn't feel like we were breaking steel or bending steel to do it, to, right. to change the gender. It's in the canon. canon. It's in the canon. Yeah. It's happened, you know. Um, Rack Shade became a woman for one issue, two issues. Um, and so it was like a no-brainer to say like, okay, well let's, let's you know, take the mythology. I mean, to me, it's in continuity with the old Shade. Yes. You know, it's important that the Young Animal books were in continuity with um, the, the stuff from the 90s that we were kind of tributing, you know. Yeah. So more in like a Star Wars type of continuity than say like a remake. Yes, oh yeah, it's tough. I don't feel like any of this stuff is a remake or a reboot right. at all. I mean, I guess a reboot is anything that you start up again, so right. maybe, but I don't know, reboot's usually when you wipe the slate, though, right? right? We're not doing that, you know. The, it's more like, yeah, like a Star Wars continuity. It's all connected. Yeah. It wasn't bleached and started over. No, it was important to us not to do that. Now, let's, let's talk about Cave Carson has a cybernetic eye. Um, great series. Thank Have, you. Has everybody seen the first issue? Yeah. yeah, it's great stuff. Now, the um, what an obscure character. Yeah, he's pretty obscure. This is a character that you found in an encyclopedia in Dan DiDio's office? Yeah, we're, I was in Dan DiDio's office and this is right when we decided, probably the same meeting, yeah. that I sat down and he said, well, what would you call it? And I said, Young Animal. And mm -hmm. um, we would later come to find out that Young Animal was the name of a kind of a softcore um, nudity magazine in Japan. <laughs> so we added the DCs in front of it, and right. and then it's not published in America, so we're we're, we're pretty clear on that. Trademark, but, you're, you're safe. He loved the name, and then he said, "Let's do it." And then he handed me this encyclopedia of DC Comics, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really excited. And I went home and I started flipping through it, and I had just ordered all the old Who's Who's yep. from eBay because I knew that was going to have characters that weren't in the encyclopedia. Right. I knew that. But then I came across this entry that was literally like a half an inch, and it said it just said Cave Carson, and I was like right away like I love the name, and then it said he was a expert geologist, a spelunker. Um, I I don't even think he's great at hand to hand combat. I think he just I think it just says he's competent. That's like Race Bannon. Yeah, he's like Race Bannon from Johnny Quest. Johnny Quest. Totally. <clears throat> um, and uh, and he has a cybernetic guy, and I was like. I was like, why doesn't it say anything else about this? Like, how did he get the eye? And then it, it turns out nobody knows how he got the eye. We did some research and he showed up in Resurrection Man in the 90s, reintroduced as having a cybernetic eye. But it was, it was kind of like back in the day where people were like cyborgs a lot because of Terminator. And it was like one of those things a little bit where he had this really intense cybernetic eye. It's not like the eye in our books. It's like bolted well, on. It was death lock. Yeah. Exactly. Like head equipment type of thing. But the, the writer used this really great trick, which is to say, like, he put the eye on the character to show that he had had adventures in between the last time you saw him that you didn't know about. Right. And I love that storytelling device. I love that trick. 
open ended on both. Open ended. Sides. So, so the writer never said where it came from or who made it or why he has it or anything. So it gave us a lot of room to play with that. And what's it like writing with John Rivera? It's amazing. I mean, we met in a comedy writing class in at SVA, and um, you know, we were the only two people that made each other laugh in the whole class, and nobody else laughed at our stuff. Um, John's about six feet tall. Yeah, he's about six big feet guy, tall. Big guy, incredibly yeah. jovial, great yes. dude. Great dude. Uh, been really close friends for a long time. And a lot of times we would sit around and just make up stories anyway. Yeah. That's what we do it over the years. I mean, we worked on TV shows together. Uh, he wrote a film script with Mikey. So, like, wow. he's, he's kind of our, you know, sometimes he's our writing buddy. Wow. Yeah. It's like the unofficial, maybe after Grant's seventh member yes. of uh, My Chemical Romance. Yeah. <laughs> so, whenever we need applause, I'm just going to say MCR. Well, um, now let's talk about um, let's talk about Mother Panic. Sure. Now, um, takes place in Gotham. Takes place in Gotham. Yeah. Um, wears all white. Wears all white. Is a female vigilante, a la Batman, and that she's wealthy. Yes. And go. Oh, let's see. Well, <laughs> she makes people angry. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to explore fame a lot. We really did. We wanted to explore kind of what it means today. Our obsession with fame. Um, what it takes to make a person famous these days as opposed right. to what it used to take back right. in the day. Um, and she is somebody that just happens to be famous because um, her dad mysteriously died when she was young mm -hmm. and um, she has a lot of money. And that's wow. kind of the only two reasons. She's like this polarizing figure. I mean, she's also famous because she says what she's thinking. She's like an orphan celebutant who's not afraid to speak her mind. Yes. Basically, yeah, yeah. And so Jody Hauser, who um, is writing the title, you may know for Faith. Yeah. Great comic, and um, she's doing she's done ad adaptations of Attack on Titan and um, Orphan Black, but she also wrote Cupcake Pow. Oh, I'm not familiar. Yeah, which is uh, I think the first web comic I ever read. Oh, cool. Yeah, and and the type of thing that would show up being shared on my friends' timelines uh -huh. on Facebook. I'm like, oh, this is great. Yeah, she's an amazing writer. Um, she helped create the character. She helped shape that character. Again, it, a lot of the Young Animal stuff was just kind of like core concept stuff. And then we would sit down and start collaborating with the writers. And, you know, Tommy and I were working on Mother Panic a little before Jody came on. Getting a look right, getting certain details right. Like, yeah. it's important to show that she was dressed like somebody in Los Angeles. It was kind of, a, you know, where she spends a lot of money to look like she doesn't give a shit. And right. Like, <laughs> you know, and that was important. Fred Seagulls. Yeah, because, you know, you see uh, as represented in comics sometimes people that are like famous or celebrities and they're, mm. they, you know, they're dressed to the nines and, mm. and we're like, no, 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 Vi you know, Violet's going to be different than that. She's going to, she's going to look pretty, pretty rough. And Tommy's been working in comics since the 80s. He worked on The Question. Yeah and uh, yep. a lot of kind of um, commercial series. Um, we had been art wanting to grab, got my yeah. Art Center pin for Tommy. Yeah, Tommy and I, Tommy Lee Edwards and I had been wanting to work together for a very long time. He just reached out one day and asked me to come to North Carolina Comic Con. Mm -hmm. I had a blast, we really connected, we talked about doing stuff together. We almost did a Batman thing together. Oh, wow. But then it transformed into Mother Panic. Yeah. And then bringing Jody in, to really hone in on the character and bring out her details and help create her with us yeah. um, was amazing. So you've got this collaboration there. Now, those titles that we've named off, so we've got Doom Patrol, Shade the Changing Girl, Cave Carson, Mother Panic, is that the entirety of the Young Animal imprint as, it, as it's envisioned currently? Yes, yeah. We're gonna really, we just wanna put a lot of work and, and care into the four books. Right. Four monthly books is totally enough for us, you know? Yeah. Like, all I do now is write, constantly. I have to go write when I leave, which is why I'm leaving so early. Gotta give him a pad for the car ride on the way back home. Well, I have to, like, write on my phone in car rides now, or I bring a notebook, and it's really hard to write in cars, but... You get motion sickness. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The same way. And then you can't read the notes, because they're, you know... So, it, Young Animal, obviously, it's it's happening, it's, it's getting a lot of great feedback, and um, it is occupying a lot of your time. 
What were some of the ideas that you had pitched before or thought of, maybe I'll start working on this, that didn't happen, that you don't think will become young animal titles in the future or won't be incorporated? Or do you constantly recycle ideas? Um, well, in terms of like, to what I brought into young animal, um, just like prior. Prior to that? Oh, there's a lot of stuff. I was working on a punk rock cat comic for a while that, you know, but that character ended up in Doom Patrol, or is going to be in Doom Patrol. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah, sometimes I'll take ideas, you want these ideas to be out there, like Mother Panic started as a creator-owned idea, where I was like, I'm gonna, basically the idea was, I'm gonna take the whole Batman thing and really turn it on its head and make it hyper-violent and foul language and, you know, all kinds of stuff, and, and then I was just like, uh, eh, let's <laughs> give her to DC, because yeah. she could live at Gotham then, how cool is that? And reach, ostensibly, a wider audience. Yeah, reach a wider audience. Yeah. And so what, what's been the biggest difference between working on a creator-owned title like Umbrella Academy and then working for DC? Um, so there's some Umbrella Academy fans out there, I take it. Yeah. You know, with Umbrella Academy, it's different because um, you have like years to write this stuff. You have a long time to, and, and in my case with Hotel Oblivion, many years to write this stuff. Um, but you're also still working on it on the bus when you're yeah, on tour. I, yeah, I still work, I work on it all the time. And what's different is, like, you know, you get to, there's no audience when you start. You get to cultivate that audience. But when you come on to something like Doom Patrol, you have, you should, I think, in my opinion, as consider. a writer, consider the people that were fans of this for a very long time, you know? Um, so I think you take those considerations that you wouldn't take, you know, I, I, I don't, but now that Umbrella has an audience, I do think of the readers that love the first two. So when you showed some of the work that you were working on Doom Patrol to Grant, was it with hesitation or a combination of hesitation and pride? It was weird. I was pretty bold about it, and I don't know why. <laughs> like, I was just kind of like, and these are characters that are very near and dear to Grant, and I yeah. just started, like, spitballing um, my takes on them. Yeah. You know, but it's funny, I have to mention, the ambulance itself was Grant's idea. So he had worked on a film script for Doom Patrol. And he told me, I think what he said to me was, yeah, they get this old ambulance and they beat it up and they spray paint it and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, but what if the ambulance was Danny? And he would just kind of look at me. Like, Danny the Street. Yeah, Danny yeah. the Street. I was like, what if you take Danny the Street, make Danny the Street, Danny the Ambulance? And um, well, the second issue's out now, so everybody kind of knows that, so I think. <laughs> So, um, but um, you know, uh, but that was kind of like this weird jump off, and that's where you have the EMTs and things like that, just because this thing in his film script that was just a visual detail, you know. Um, well, it's interesting too that there's the the first part of the story has an almost kind of powers element to it, and you've got a guy that was working on powers working on Cape Carson, right? And Cave Carson having a kind of cybernetic eye and that kind of weird science fiction aspect is like, well, Shade the Changing Girl is an alien. Right. That there is a kind of interesting, weird, wonderful, and um, you know, fantastic element to the different series that all have a very different voice, but all work. Yeah. You know, it's like four things that work really well together. Yeah, they needed to work well together. That was important. And they need to be extremely different from each other. That was also very important. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really great place to end this, and I really want to thank Gerard Way for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Talking about uh, Young Animal. Um, you, can, you can hear this podcast. Um, it will be rebroadcast as a pod sequentialism episode next Sunday. Um, I encourage you to, to find us on, on Instagram at podsec, P-O-D-S-E-Q. Look for pod sequentialism um, on Facebook and uh, Twitter. And, um, of course, the many amazing things that Gerard is doing. Uh, you have any social media you want to shout out? What's that? You have any social media you want to shout out? Uh, I uh, I don't use Twitter anymore. I kind of have an Instagram I kind of use. <laughs> um, I have a website, which I usually, I was supposed to update all the time with these kind of morning pages that I do, but I got real busy with the comics. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, but that's kind of where you can find me, I guess, those places. Perfect. Well, again, thank you, Gerard Way. Thank you, guys.